If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Period. If you're just the normal, typical, evangelical, you're wrong about almost everything. We are so far removed from Scripture that if someone comes to us with Scripture, we think they're out of their minds. I know this is going to be offensive to you, but you're totally broken. We can't tweak you. We can't add a few little silly Christian cliches onto a secular life and that result in true discipleship. I'm sorry, it's not going to happen. I'm talking about following Jesus Christ. You say it's not difficult in the United States. The most difficult place I've had to follow Jesus Christ, the most costliest place, is the United States. And if it doesn't cost you anything, it's because you've bought in to American Christianity. But listen to this. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. One thing about Scripture, it just drops it like a ton of lead right on you. So absolute. If you came in this door right now and you told us you just got hit by an 18-wheeler and you look just like you all look right now, we'd all say you're lying to us. I don't think that's, that's the basic weight of the matter. He's saying, look, when you're born again and when you're indwelt by the Spirit of God, it is so radical and it so produces a love for God and a hate for this world that it is so stark, it is so real, it is so obvious and if you have believed in Jesus, if you truly have unto salvation, you have been regenerated and your heart has been changed and that new heart has new affections. And those affections are righteous and holy and Godward. And those new affections drive your will to a different life. You know what a lot of people think that, that Christianity is? They think Christianity is... Um, you doing all the righteous things you hate and avoiding all the wicked things you love in order to go to heaven. No, that's a lost man and religion. A Christian is a person whose heart has been changed. They have new affections. But, like a child that's been born, they're going, I, knew, I have new affections. They're Godward. I love God. I, I want to be conformed to the image of Christ. But how do I do it? And that's where the Word of God comes in. It's not burdensome to you, forcing you to do what you don't want to do and keeping you from doing all the rotten things you want to. No, you've been changed. You just need to know how to walk now. The problem is, because the gospel presentation in America is so weak, pray this prayer, ask Jesus to come into your heart, you're saved. So many people think they're saved, but their heart, their desires, everything has not been changed ever. And so then you get them into a discipleship program and you try to force them to walk like a sheep when they're still a goat. It doesn't work. So the first thing is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The evidence that you're a Christian is not that you confess faith in Jesus or you're a part of some Christian ministry or anything. It's that your affections have changed. They're Godward. You love Jesus Christ. And you have no bones about if it says in Scripture you're to do something... Okay, let's do it. He said it. He's master. That's what Lord means. The truth is, this is, so, this is so obvious when it happens to somebody's life. It takes them where they're in this course and it totally spins them around so obviously that, brethren, I've seen it. I've seen this happen to people. The worldliness just starts to fall off. One after another, it falls off. And I'll tell you this, people that have supposedly had this amazing, this amazing transformation happen in their life and conversion, and all of a sudden, two, three, four, five years down the road, the worldliness just hasn't fallen off, brethren. They're just, there's no truth to it. Mm -hmm. you, you say, well, you can't say that. You're judging I can say that because God's Word says that. If that person shows by a continuous, ongoing lifestyle that they're in love with the world, they do not love God. They are those adulteresses and adulterers that James is dealing with, and they're at enmity with God. Lay it down. Hands down, folks. You know what? I got people in this room right now, you are as lost as anything. 
you are lost, you are still dead in your sins, and you are following the course of this world. It's just real. I know when it, with this many people in a room, there's an, any number of you that fit that description. So I've got one of two kinds of people here. I've got people that are following the course of the world now, or I've got people who were. So this isn't foreign to any of us. You know what? There's a mindset in other countries, if you're an American, you're a Christian. Well, those people are sadly misled. They don't know our country. Our country is wicked. And the Christians are few. Just like they're few in other countries, they're few here. There may be many churches, and there may be church buildings on every street corner, on every corner of our, in our cities across this country. But the true Christians are few. How much of your life is defined by what the Word of God says? By what Jesus says? And how much of it is defined by culture? Just think about that. How many Christians do you know could open up a Bible and go down biblically, verse by verse, and show you why they do what they do in their relationships with the opposite sex? How many Christians do you know could open up the Bible and go verse by verse and tell you, this is, the why, this is why I dress this way. This is why I talk this way. This is why I'm in college. Almost no one. Entering in the narrow gate is allowing Him to define your life and not in general terms. See, there's your problem. Oh, Jesus is everything to me and Jesus is Lord. Okay, specifically though, explain to me what that means. What does it cost you? How have you changed your life from the course the rest of the world is walking in? Well, I don't know what you're talking about. Therein lies the problem. You don't know what I'm talking about. This is true. That's a reality. When you look at the, all the pictures of Judgment Day, what differentiates those who are saved from those who are lost on Judgment Day is the life they lived and how it was so drastically different from the life of those who didn't have it. That, that's always what it is. It's never just a, it's never just a, did you, did you claim to believe in Jesus? Well, yes, I did. Okay, you're in. It's never that. It's always, what did, what did all your confessions of Christ actually yield in your life? Do they show that Christ was with you? Do they show an evidence of... And this is what he's saying. Depart from me, those of you who claim to be my disciples, but you lived as though I never gave you a law to obey. Now, isn't that frightening? How many of you are guiding your life based on principles, commands, and laws, and statements of wisdom that Jesus has given? How many Christians do you actually know that are living that way? Depart from me, those of you who said, Lord, Lord, and considered yourselves to be my disciples, but you lived as though I never gave you a law to obey. That's something. And what he says, you and I never had an intimate relationship. What? You went through that track and then prayed the prayer at the end? What's that? I never knew you. You, you didn't come to me, seek me. We didn't walk together, talk together. You didn't seek me for counsel. You didn't follow my law. You didn't treat me as king. You weren't a part of any of the principles or commands of the kingdom? Absolutely not. I don't know you. Depart from me. But you have to understand, you come out of a Christianity that in its theology is absolutely despicable. We're an aberration. I'm not saying this to hurt you. I'm saying it because it's true. It really is, and you need to be afraid about it. And you need to get serious. If you are going to walk with Jesus Christ, you are going to be opposed by everything in the world and by the great majority of evangelicals. You're going to be opposed.
What I'm asking you to do is think. Please, think. Why do you do what you do? Why do you dress the way you dress? Why do you use the jewelry you use? Why do you do what you do with your money? Why do you do what you do with your time? Why do you watch what you watch on television or at the movies or on the computer? Why do you do what you do on the computer? Do you have God-glorifying reasons for all of it? Do you live in that faith, believing what I am doing is glorifying God? Because whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Whatsoever you do, whether you eat or drink, you are to do it for the glory of God. We need to be people who think. Don't just do it because other people at school do it. Don't just do it because other people at work do it. The worldly system is everywhere around us. Do what you do because you can substantiate it from the Word of God. Period. Are your motives deceitful desire, worldly desire, desire that wages war against your flesh or against your soul, driven? Are they driven by those passions or is it driven by a desire to please God? That's what we have to ask ourselves. What is the motive? Well, I dress this way because I want to get this guy's attention. I hope you would see what the motive is. When the Bible says, if you want to get a guy's attention, the kind of guy that, guy's attention that you probably ought to be trying to get, you should be working on a meek and quiet spirit, ladies, knowing the Scriptures. That's what 1 Peter 3 says. I mean, young guys, if you're, if you're working out to get the lady's attention, you're working out because you want to be all hulked up and big and look like the world. Now look, physical exercise profits some. If it helps you discipline yourself and it helps you feel better and you're not near as tired during the day and you can get by with less sleep and it just overall makes you feel better, there may be a place for it. But is it Godliness driven. What we wear. I mean, do you wear what you wear because you're wanting to glorify God? Do you give? Do you use your money in ways that are God glorifying? What is your motive behind what you do with your money? If you're going to make the decision to have a television or not have one, I know Christians that have them. I know Christians that don't have them. What's your motive? What are you accomplishing? When you eat, why do you eat the way you do? When you drink. If you were going to say, well, the Bible allows me to drink alcoholic beverage, you need to ask yourself, why? Why are you doing it? Is there a motive there that is God glorifying? It's not God glorifying if you do things that will cause a brother to stumble and you do it right, before, right in front of them. If meat or drink cause your brother to stumble, you need to abstain. Why do we do what we do? Are we trying to win people to Christ? Hudson Taylor dressed like a Chinaman to win Chinamen, and he did. Paul became all things to all men that he might save some. By all means, he might save some. 
You see, when you're driven by love, when you're driven by a desire to save people, when you're driven by a desire to grow, when you're driven by a desire to become more godly, when you're driven by a desire to become more meek, more Bible knowledgeable, when you're driven by a desire not to make my brothers and sisters stumble, that there's see see the motivation versus when you just want pleasure. And so you're going to do what you want to do because you want fun. You're going to do what you want to do because you want to enjoy. You're going to do what you want to do because you want to satisfy these desires. That's dangerous ground. Listen, they wage war against the soul. And people lose their soul in this fight all the time. By God's grace, by God's strength, by God's power, abide in Christ and seek to live the right motives, bringing your thought life, bringing your motives in subjection to Christ all the time, in subjection to Christ, being led, guided, motivated by love. Let love rule your life. Let love for God and love for your fellow man rule your motives, not passions, but love. God help us. If you really believe that this is all true, if this is indeed, you know, you know what it says over in the what is it, Revelation 14? It says that when we enter into our rest, our deeds follow us. I'll tell you this, through all eternity, the things you do in this life in the service of Christ are going to follow you there. And yet you're giving yourself to the trivialities and the vanities of this life. Amazing! You know what? You're a professing child of God. You say you believe in eternal rewards. You say there's treasure to be had in heaven. But then you compare yourself with a lost man. And he's outrunning you. He's investing in all his stuff in this life because he believes it's going to bring him pleasure. You say you believe the greatest pleasures are at his right hand in the world to come. And yet by your life you're not proving it and he's outrunning you and the things and his objectives, what he wants to accomplish than what you're running in. We speak one way, brethren, and we live another way. And we ought to hang our heads that this world should be outrunning us. Jesus Christ said, I would, you would show yourself in or out, hot or cold. And if you're going to be lukewarm, if you're going to serve me with a half heart, it sickens me, I'll vomit you out of my mouth. He's not speaking to some Turks over there in Izmir, bowing down to their Allah over at the... No, he's, talking, he's speaking to a church just like I'm speaking to now. Not to the lost hordes out there. He's speaking to the church. And he's saying, if you're going to try to serve me with a half heart, divided heart, I hate it. It sickens me. Go one way or the other, but get off the middle. And if you're not ready, listen, and I say this as far as membership to this church, if you're not willing to commit to be hot and to commit to go all the way, I'm not saying God may not move you, God may not take you another place, that may happen. But when you come, you need to be committed to serve the living Christ with some heat, with some fervency, with some passion, with some commitment. If you want to play games, there's a lot of other places you can go play games. But we want to do it according to the Word, do we not? And it says do it with fervency. It says don't be slothful in this. Zeal matters. Passion matters. Over and over and over and over again in the Bible, we find intensity matters. Zeal matters. Wholeheartedness matters. Don't settle for anything less. Too many lazy Christians, or at least professing Lazy Christians. Make no mistake about it. The Lord Christ is calling you to put away your idleness. Put away your slothfulness. All your laziness. All your half-heartedness. Serve Him as a slave with a boiling spirit. That's what we're called to do. Brethren, don't be slothful. Don't be idle. We have too much sloth and sluggardliness and slowness in Christians today, I'm serving the one who died for me. I'm serving the one who gave himself for me. I'm serving him whom 
gave himself up a fragrant offering to his Father on my behalf. Now let that sink in. Beloved, we don't just want to serve Christ. We want to love Christ. We're not like those pagans. Oh, I've got pictures in my mind. Hindus in their yard with their little dollhouse looking altars. Bowing really fast. And also, it's almost like you look at it and it's like, that, that, that can be real. That's, that's, we're not like them. We don't serve our Christ like the pagans, all full of fear, all full of terror. Brethren, if, if Christ were to stand here right now, and you know, He would speak with authority and yet with compassion. If He spoke in that way and He said, look at my wounds. I've done this for you. What have you done for me? Is this not worth your fervency? Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. One thing about Scripture, it just drops it like a ton of lead right on you. So absolute. Why? I mean, come on, John. Give us a little slack here. Can I love some, some things in the world just a, a little? Why does it... Why does it seem like so often Scripture just... I mean, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Period. You know why? You know why I have to believe that? Because just like with the rest of John, if you come along and you say you know Him and you don't keep His commandments, bang! Again. Just boom! Hit you with a ton of lead. You're a liar. Mm. Brethren, the reality is this. It's like Paul Washer said before. If you came in this door right now and you told us you just got hit by an 18-wheeler and you look just like you all look right now, we'd all say you're lying to us. I don't think that's, that's the basic weight of the matter. He's saying, look, when you're born again, and when you're indwelt by the Spirit of God, it is so radical, and it so produces a love for God and a hate for this world, that it is so stark, it is so real, it is so obvious, that is there a battle? Well, yes, there's a battle, because obviously we've got to wage war against these anti-soul forces, one of which is the world that we're not to be conformed to, we're not to love it, and so there is this fight not to do it, but it is so real, and it is so... It, brethren, it isn't the kind of thing where you live your life in love with the world all the time and you're trying to th get out the magnifying glass and stare and look and strain and squint to figure out if you're a Christian or not. The truth is, this is so, this is so obvious when it happens to somebody's life. It takes them where they're in this course and it totally spins them around so obviously that, brethren, I've seen it. I've seen this happen to people. The worldliness just starts to fall off. One after another, it falls off. And I'll tell you this, people that have supposedly had this amazing, this amazing transformation happen in their life and conversion, and all of a sudden, two, three, four, five years down the road, the worldliness just hasn't fallen off. Brethren, just, there's no truth to it. Mm -hmm. you, you say, well, you can't say that. You're judging. I can say that because God's Word says that. If that person shows by a continuous, ongoing lifestyle that they're in love with the world, they do not love God. They are those adulteresses and adulterers that James is dealing with, and they're at enmity with God. Lay it down. Hands down, folks. This is, this is absolute. I mean, this is... Brethren, yes, there's a battle. I don't, I don't doubt that. But this is a battle for life and death. And that's what we're told here. This is the mark of true faith. 
Are you living your life? I mean, all of it is invested in what God has said in this Word. And that's, this is your life. This is where it rests. This is where your hope is. It's in the words God has spoken in this book. You've rested your soul here. You've rested your all here. Your trust, your confidence, it's all on the words that God has spoken. It's on what this book reveals in words about who God is, who Christ is. Your trust is there. Your rest is there. You live your life banking on the realities of this book. You're not like John 2. You're not like those that crossed over the vast majority of them with whom God was not pleased. That you only believe what you can see. You're only going to believe God that He's going to give us a building after we get one. You only believe God that people get saved actually in this world at this time through the preaching of the Gospel after you see them saved. You only believe that God will take care of your financial needs once you have money in your pocket. But before that, you're full of anxieties, you're full of worries, distrust, you're grumbling. Look at this. All we got to eat is manna. Would have been better off the way it was before. Listen, you listen. There is opportunity like we talked about before. There is opportunity to return. If you really believe what's in this book, you won't go back. Because what it says in this book is, it's outstanding. It's the most glorious. It's the most magnificent truths. It presents the most beautiful, precious Christ. The most glorious salvation. The most anticipated eternity. But in this life, it promises God will be our God and He will take care of His people. He will not forsake His people. You may get sawn in two. You may die by the sword. You may have to live in a cave. But you can do it trusting the Lord. Brethren, we are people who are called believers for a reason. I mean, make decisions in your life that put God to the test in the promises here. That's never presumption. To put God to the test based on... It's presumption when you trust God, when you expect God to do what He's never promised to do. Those people that went into Canaan after they were told not to, that was presumption. Jesus Christ, if He would have jumped off the pinnacle of the temple, would have been presumption. But to expect God to do what He's promised, that's never presumption. That's faith. Amen. And you should take what He has said in, these, in this book and you should memorize it. You should know it. You should plead it and give God no rest until He does what He promises to do. Live your life on this. Rest in these promises. Trust that that Red Sea is going to open up. Trust it. This is an example for us upon whom the end of the ages has come. Men don't like this God. Men don't like this Word. Because it scares them. And it ought to. Don't you want to be able to wake up in a morning and face life with a sense of the love of Christ that is so overwhelming and so compelling and so moving in you and fills you with such excitement and faith and trust and joy and fear and sometimes dread of even defiling that relationship that you feel a compulsion to do right and to be right and to be holy and to be blameless in your family, in your work, in your church, in your life. Brethren, don't you want that? Don't you want to feel the power of the cross, the power of resurrection surging inside of you in a way that is real, it is tangible, it is experiential. You know it. It's not a mystery. It's not something that, well... 
You try to force yourself to feel. You, try, you see it in other people or you hear it in the Word, so you try to convince yourself that it's true when all the time you know it's not. All the time you know what's really driving you is passions for this world, passions for these things. Don't you really want to know that? Don't you want to know those movings, those sensations of love that grip you and grasp you and hold you and compel you and move you? Don't you want that? Does anybody here want just a lifeless, dead, useless religion? God forbid, brethren, be done with that. Brethren, I am afraid. I am afraid that our lives, among some, they tend to be sloppy because we don't have this. We're casual with the Word of God. We've got so many Bibles in this country. Most of us have multiple versions got it on our computers, got it on our bookshelves, got it on our coffee tables. Have we forgotten what we hold in our hands? Maybe we'd be better off in a day where there was only one Bible in a church. It might give us a sense that when that book was opened, it was special. There have been days, my brothers and sisters, when men and women have shook before this book. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. To some of your minds you think, well yes, we persuade lost men. That's not where Paul's going there. Paul's not saying, oh yeah, the case of lost men is so fearful, we need to persuade them to come to Christ. We should do that. That's not what he's saying there. He's talking to Christians. And you know what he says to them? He says, dear Christian brothers and sisters, make it your aim to please the Lord. Why? Because we all are going to have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account. And you will be judged by that word. You just going to flippantly throw it over there? When Paul says, look, look, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God if you're lost outside here, but he's coming to the Christians and he's saying, look, make it the aim of your life to please the Lord because you will stand before the judgment seat of Christ knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. He's not talking about the terror of the Lord that will be experienced by the lost. He's saying, man, woman, you that profess to be children of God, do you not know that no matter if your sins be forgiven or not, that to go before Christ on that day is an awful thing? Every one of your works will be examined. You will come before those eyes and before the God who gave you a standard to live by. And you will be judged. Yes, brethren, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. But Paul does not back off because he says that to the Romans. Back off from telling the Corinthians that there is terror. There is fear. Brethren, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Brethren, you should fear. Fear! You should tremble lest you walk away from God. Lest you walk away from His Word. Brethren, people, when they come to a place where they realize what God wants them to do and they just kind of flippantly say, well, yeah, I, know, I, I know, but He'll understand. He's forgiving. We should tremble lest we walk away from God. You should tremble if you feel any inclination to leave this God, leave His Word, walk away from His truth. 
Because if you walk away, there is a certainty of destruction. There is certainty. It is a fearful thing. And if you ever tell people that God does not have fierce wrath towards the sinner, not just the sin, but towards the sinner, then you're lying to them. Because I don't find verses that speak and show God to pour out wrath on sin. What's that? What's, how do you pour out wrath on sin? Where is it? Listen to this. I'm just going to give you five verses that deal with God's wrath. You tell me who the recipients of the wrath are. Exodus 22.22 22, You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them, and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry and my wrath will burn, and I will kill you with the sword. Leviticus 26, 27. But in spite of this, you will not listen to me, but walk contrary to me. Then I will walk contrary to you in fury. 2 Kings 22, 13. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book and do according to all that is written concerning us. Ezra 8.22, the hand of our God is for good on all who seek Him, and the power of His wrath is against all who forsake Him. Psalm 21.8, your hand will find out all your enemies. Your right hand will find out those who hate you. You will make them as a blazing oven when you appear. The Lord will swallow them up in His wrath and fire will consume them. Folks, His wrath is directed against sinners, not just sin. Let me tell you something else about His wrath. It's fearful. There's no other way to put it. It is infinitely dreadful. So often it's likened to fire. I find various times it's likened to drinking a cup even the dregs of the cup, which I think is where we get the picture that Christ uses when He's in the garden. If it was possible, He was praying to His Father that He would be delivered from that cup, a cup of wrath. But more times than anything else in the Bible, you tell me, you listen to this, you hear what this wrath is likened to. Exodus 15.7 you send out your fury, it consumes them like stubble. 2 Kings 53.26 The burning of His great wrath. Psalm 21.9 You will make them as a blazing oven when you appear. The Lord will swallow them up in His wrath and fire will consume them. Isaiah 66.15 for behold, the Lord will come in fire, and His chariots like the whirlwind to render His anger in fury and His rebuke with flames of fire. Jeremiah 4.4 4. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Remove the foreskin of your hearts, O men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my wrath go forth like fire, and burn with none to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. Ezekiel 21.31, I will blow upon you with the fire of my wrath. Ezekiel 38.19, my blazing wrath. Jeremiah 17.4, in my anger a fire is kindled that shall burn forever. Isaiah 30.30, 30, in furious anger and a flame of devouring fire. Deuteronomy 32.22, 
For a fire is kindled by my anger, and it burns to the depths of Sheol, devours the earth and its increased, and sets on fire the foundations of the mountains. Deuteronomy 29.20 The anger of the Lord and His jealousy will smoke against that man. <coughs> Folks, this is one of the most fearful verses that I have ever read in the Bible. Ezekiel 22.20 As one gathers silver and bronze and iron and lead and tin into a furnace to blow the fire on it in order to melt it, so I will gather you in my anger and in my wrath, and I will put you in and melt you. I will gather you and blow on you with the fire of my wrath, and you shall be melted in the midst of it. You know what? Man wants to ignore it. He wants to forget it. He wants to suppress it. <laughs> And man likes to think, oh, my sin isn't that bad. And God isn't that angry. And man somehow thinks some way, somehow, well, even if hell's real, I'm going to be down there with all my friends. I will gather you and blow on you with the fire of my wrath and you shall be melted in the midst of it. Man thinks he's going to stand up to it. But I tell you what, when God blows upon him with the wrath of his vengeance, with the fires, a smoke, a blaze, man will yield immediately. There will be no fight in him. He will succumb to that wrath. Folks, the wrath of God is fearful. And I'll tell you this, nothing but sin brings out this characteristic of God. Wrath is the way a holy God does respond and to the wickedness of men. But I'll tell you a third thing about this wrath. It's righteous. Listen to this. This is in Romans 2 verse 5. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. You know what most men feel? They feel that the wrath of God, if it's as bad as the Bible says it is, if, if, if the, and the Bible says it's terrific, it's terrifying to the uttermost, if it's that bad, man looks at it and says, wait a second, if it's that bad, this is excessive. God's going overboard here. Man cannot conceive of God having such a massive reaction on God's part to our little sins. So they, so they look, they, they, this can't be. This is, this is overkill. I'll tell you what, the problem is not that God is excessive it's not that he's extreme. It's not that he's disproportionate. The Bible says his judgment is righteous. Folks, the problem is we underestimate the degree of our crime, our guilt. Our guilt is on a level that we know not. The problem lies not in our assessment of His wrath. The problem lies in our assessment 
of the excessiveness of our sin. That's where it lies. God's wrath shouldn't make us think of an overreacting God. It should make us think of underestimating foolish men. God's wrath is reasonable if we understand our sin. Does it really matter to you that your unsaved loved ones are dying and we're getting closer and closer to the end? Does it really concern you? They could die and go to hell? Even though you're a lover of Christ? Where's the anguish? Where are the tears? Where's the mourning? Where, where's the fasting? Closer than that, does it matter about the Jerusalem that's in our own hearts? But one of the really sad things about this moment right now is that there are hundreds of you in this crowd who do not want your life to make a difference. All you want is to be liked. Maybe finish school, get a good job, find a husband or a wife, a nice house, a nice car, good vacations, grow old healthy, have a fun retirement, die easy, no hell. And that's all you want. You don't give a rip whether your life counts on this earth for eternity. And that's a tragedy in the making. And I get 40 minutes to plead with you, don't buy it. With all my heart, I plead with you, don't buy that dream. I just want to be an ordinary Christian. I don't want to carry this kind of a burden. I don't want to have to weep over my family anymore. I'm going to go take it by faith. You see, you, you, you either walk away and go back to your passivity and say, I'm just going to be an ordinary Christian and there's no such thing. No anguish. No fasting, no prayer, no brokenness. Let's just do it. Our so-called awakenings, our stirrings, last but a short time. And when the last, when the re short-lived revivings and awakenings come from the hand of God, they are so short-lived. And in those times, we promise God we'll never return to our passivity. But it's not long, it's just weeks or months and we're back and this time we slip further back into passivity than when we started. I speak from experience. And we say this time, oh God, you've touched me for life. I'll never be the same. And it's like fireworks. A loud bang and a lot of noise and then it dies. That's all the devil wants to do is get the fight out of you and kill it. So you won't labor in prayer anymore. You won't weep before God anymore. You can sit and watch television and your family go to hell. Whatever happened to anguish in the house of God? Whatever happened to anguish in the ministry? It's a word you don't hear in this pampered age. You don't hear it. Anguish means extreme pain and distress. The emotion so stirred that it becomes painful. Acute, deeply felt inner pain because of conditions about you, in you or around you. Anguish. Deep pain. Deep sorrow. 
agony of God's heart. A true prayer life begins at the place of anguish, a place where lifetime decisions are made. You see, if you, you set your heart to pray, God's going to come and start sharing your heart, His heart with you. He's going to open up His heart, and I'll tell you, there's pain in His heart. But He sees, and so few to hear. He's going to show you the condition of His church. He's going to show you the condition of your own heart. And He's going to ask you a question. What is it to you? What is it? Why didn't God use them in restoration? Why didn't they have a word? Because there was no sign of anguish. No weeping. Not a word of prayer. It's all ruin. If it has not been born by the Holy Spirit, where when you saw and heard of the ruin, and it drove you to your knees, took you down into a baptism of anguish where you began to pray and seek God. And then finally coming for street rallies here in the city and walk in the streets and then wind up on 42nd Street and see them selling a kind of heroin would kill you. Say, I've got the good stuff, it'll kill you. And I remember breaking down and it didn't matter the crowds going by. I sat on a fire hydrant tape on the side of a building and wept. And I was in anguish. I was in anguish four blocks from here on Broadway. Weeping and crying and wailing. I wasn't looking for a ministry. I wasn't looking to build a church. I was feeling God's pain for a lost city. And I've never had anything that's been any worse to God in my 50 years that wasn't born in agony. Never. Never. It's all been flesh otherwise. <laughs> and all our projects, all our ministries, everything we do, where are the Sunday school teachers that weep over kids they know? are not hearing and they're going to hell. And I cry, oh God, where are the voices? Where are the people that cry out against them? Where are the praying people? And I say, God, whatever it takes, whatever it takes, keep me on my knees. There's going to be no renewal, no revival, no awakening until we're willing to let him once again break us. God, that's what we desire. You will rarely find a message now on repentance. Look at what has become of the world, Church of Christ, through you, losing what you should have been. But God waits for His people. God waits for His people. When will they take the stepping stones God has placed in His Word? church that has forgotten its foundations, a church that's turned away from its beginnings and begins to become a harlot church. Just, just tell me how blessed I am. Just tell me I'm, I'm, I'm going to be powerful and popular and going to have no trouble in my life. For the, just tell me these things. Watered down. Half-truths. This gospel says, just believe and get saved. There's nothing of repentance, nothing of godly sorrow, nothing of turning from your sins, nothing about taking up your cross and following the Lord. But people who say a little prayer said, you're fine, you're good. People believe that any standard, even if the New Testament is legalism and bondage and law, 
Any standard is law. I'm under grace. I can do anything. Oh, that's from the devil. Now we've revised that and said, if you can get people for one hour on Sunday morning in the building, that's the church. That's not the church. We can use every device we want to get people for one hour and keep it early and keep it moving and keep it going. But that's not the church Jesus built. And I'm embarrassed to be part of the church of Jesus today because I believe it's an embarrassment to a holy God. Most of our joy is clapping our hands and having a good time and then afterwards we're talking all the dribble of the world. Don't talk to us about holiness or separation from the world. Don't, we don't want to hear of that, folks. People today don't want to hear anything they call gloom and doom. If, if it's not smooth, it's gloom and doom. Well, friend, let me tell you lovingly, go to hell and live with all the scum of the earth. You like to drink, go with the drinkers. You like to lust, go with the prostitutes. To have been covered in something deceptive to find in the last moments of your life that the feet coming down the hallway are not taking you to heaven. You can get through the deception your whole life. You can even sing in the choir. And I think we better watch this business of, you know, God loves you, God loves you, and all the bumper sticker sloppy evangelism. Will you remind people of the goodness and the severity of God? Will you remind them that there's a day when mercy is cut off forever? Will you remind them that people pray in hell but nobody ever answers? But in spite of what God has spoken, they create a garment of fig leaves and they cover themselves and say, all is well, all is well. And they seek out a church that won't challenge their sin, that won't expose this hypocrisy for what it is. I'd rather you get mad at me and go to heaven. This so-called love gospel today only reaches the flesh. It can't get to the heart. It can't dig into sin so that there can be a cleansing. And if I'm a surgeon of the Holy Ghost, I'm not going to put a bandage on you when you've got cancer sticking out of a bone or, or on your flesh. We're going to say, hey, we've got to get in there. It has to be dealt with. And we do. I don't care if you like me, but I'm a good surgeon and I know what I'm doing and I'm going to get your cancer out. This is the reason why some who are listening even now and will be listening to tapes in the future, you just can't lighten up and enjoy these theologically shallow experiences like so many around you are today. Everyone around you is saying, oh, lighten up, lighten up. God's love, God's good, God's kind, God is nice. Come to church in your Bermuda short, stick your feet on the altar rail, have a coffee and cookies with us. We'll hear three point messages on nothing about God. But there's a stirring in you. There's a stirring in the true bride in this generation. Now I'm going to tell you something. A diluted gospel is no gospel at all. Businessmen. They were crass businessmen coming into something that God said, My house shall be called a house of prayer. You made it a den of thieves. You're getting over on the people. Out with you. And if you don't believe this is happening in our generation, I challenge you to go to a Christian bookstore this week and Find the best sellers. Ask them which are the best sellers and look at them. Look at the covers of the images of men, not the images of God. Five steps to be like me. Five steps to better yourself. Five steps to the new you. Five steps to a wonderful destiny with their glossy faces on the cover. Not so subtly telling the church of Jesus Christ, if you use the principles of God, you will look like me. In the 14th chapter of Romans, and he says, we, so he writes home, even to believers at the judgment seat. We must all, there's no exception. We must stand at the judgment seat of Christ. You can't send your lawyer, you can't send a representative. Because one day, it doesn't matter if your friends approve of you, it doesn't matter how many albums you sell, one day the Bible says, I'm going to stand in front of the one whose eyes are like fire, and I can't get over on him. All of you that sing in that choir, it's not just if you're on your note, it's why you're on your note. Can you see all the saints of all the ages? And Leonard Rayville is standing there before a God Christ whose eyes are full of holiness, where the place is breathing holiness, where there's all the majesty of an awesome God. And he reads the record of my poor life before all the saints of all the ages. Answer God, all you theologians reasoning out my theology. Just answer God, are you pure in heart? And you became enamored with your own beauty. And your whole theological focus now is how you can be smarter, better, better looking, more prosperous. You lost the call of God, church. You've made it a place just to make a buck. So out with you. 
church of Christ with God, when will you grieve more? Hunger, thirst of the righteousness. And I'm going to tell you something. A diluted gospel is no gospel at all. To come new, but when the church is in the state we are, the standard is not preached or lived or presented. We need to seek God back for the standard of this book, not men's standard. What Christ says, I'm not presenting to you some holiness of a holiness movement. I'm teaching to you Christ's word that the only holiness is not heresy. I want to challenge you with everything in me. Put away lifeless religion. Put away empty pursuits of God. Put away all of the deception of the carnal nature. Holy, be ye holy, for I am holy. That's God's words, not mine. Would to God that Episcopalian, Presbyterian, Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal pastors begin to stand up and see what's happening to the church that was once called the Church of Jesus Christ. Backsliding, turning apostate, turning against the truths of their heaven, of their, their founding fathers. When I see the church in the New Testament, they didn't have stately buildings, they didn't have paid evangelists, they didn't have a lot of money, they didn't have organization, they did, couldn't get on TV and beg, but I'll tell you what they did, they turned the world upside down. But yeah, are you big enough to say, Lord, in this crucial hour in human history, let me fill up the sufferings of Christ. But if the Holy Spirit is truly, truly upon you in this generation, you will not be satisfied. You will not be found among those who sit in supposed houses of God with your feet on the altar rail and a cup of coffee in your hand listening to a PowerPoint sermon about a Christ they don't know. You'll not be satisfied. Because if you're going to get mature in God, all the dwarfs around you will criticize and sneer at you and say you're trying to be holier than the rest of us, eh? For God has not merely given us Jesus Christ, He's given us all things. And because there isn't enough joy in the house of God, we need entertainment. Because entertainment is the devil's substitute for joy. We're living in a time, as the prophet Malachi said, when those who feared the Lord are going to get together one more time and think on His name, and a book of remembrance will be written for them, and they will return, and they will know the difference between those who serve God and those who don't serve Him. Folks, we've got to deal with sin. We've got to deal with things that in life, you know, they're divorcing and all these things we have to do something about. We have to face a holy God one day. There's a great trial coming, folks, for everyone. Praise God. He's going to deliver the true believer. I want you to change your message. I'm telling you now, the judgment is at the door. The handwriting is on the wall. The whole world is shaking, and you're amusing this people. Even if you have to bury your theology, sir, just bury it tonight and get right with God. So turn from your sin, for all this society is about to come under the justice of God. When the Word of God comes forth in its power and unction, it'll do one of two things. It'll either break you or harden you. It'll break you or harden you. An apostate church wants nothing to do with visions or prophecies of men of righteousness. They don't want anything to do with it. They want to hear messages. They, they want nothing that disturbs the status quo. Nothing to upset the successful world in which they move and live. They refused any kind of correction. Why is it that people are flocking to prosperity preachers? Why is it when you preach prosperity you can draw a crowd simply because it suits the lifestyles of those who gather? They flock to these teachers because they feel comfortable with them because of their world of materialism. They're in no mood to give up anything or to sacrifice or to hear about crosses or losses. They're into buying and acquiring, enjoying and climbing the social ladder. 
Folks, if that's all I was going to do, if I wanted to, if I wanted to get rich and if I, if I had all these things and I felt condemned, I'd go to a preacher go set my mind at ease. But when you've got the fire of the Holy Ghost burning in your heart and Jesus Christ is the head, you can't go near it because the fire of the Holy Ghost will burn it out. Preachers don't know what to preach anymore. If they preach this, they offend this group. They preach something else, they offend this group. Brother, forget what the people say and preach the Holy Word of God. An apostate church simply endures the prophetic voice. They pass it by with a condescending smile. I'm going to read to you. Listen to Ezekiel 33. Don't turn, but just listen to it. He said, they come to you as my people come, and they sit before you as my people, and they hear your words, but they don't do them. For they do the lustful desires expressed by their mouth, and their heart goes after their own gain and their idols. And behold, you are to them like a sensual song by one who has a beautiful voice and plays well on an instrument. And they hear your words, but they do not practice them. When the Spirit of God would come upon me, I'd begin to prophesy against the idolatry of television and rock music of devils in our churches. And I could feel the wrath of God against it. I'd go in the backyard and prophesy to the trees because I didn't think anyone would listen. I'd just raise my voice and prophesy. You've been bringing unclean offerings. You've brought bruised and bleeding lambs to my table and the tables of the Lord are filled with vomit. And I was prophesying and prostrate on the grass and feeling the wrath of God breathing down my neck against it all. And I get up and I bleed my heart out. And I can quote a hundred scriptures against this kind of idolatry. And, and, and people come up and pat me on the back and say, Good preaching, Brother Dave, I believe it. And go right back that very night and sit and watch filth. And it's kind of an amusing message. It's kind of a novel thing to hear someone prophesy now. What's it going to be for you, brother, sister? Is it going to be that you hear the prophetic word of the Lord come? And then you walk out and say it's a sweet, sensual song. And go right back and do the same very thing. As if you were never delivered from your idolatry in the first place. I don't understand how anyone who loves God with all their heart. I don't understand anyone who knows that one day soon they're going to stand before the judgment seat of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't see how you can sit before your idols anymore knowing that you stand before His holy eyes. state church of the last day is not going to accept this message of repentance whether I preach it or any, any other man of God preaches it it's not going to be accepted by the masses it's going to be accepted only by a holy separated view Isaiah 30 verse 15 for thus says the Lord the Holy One of Israel has said what in repentance and rest you shall be saved in quietness and trust in quietness and trust is your strength but you were not willing and you said no. You're not willing. You said no. Oh, brother, sister, listen to me. The message of the Holy Ghost to this last day church is that in repentance and rest is your only hope. The only hope left for the church is to return to Him with all their heart and to get out of Egypt and the world. A generation of Christians tell them that their only hope is in repentance tell them that see how many listen
The last thing the devil wants you to do is hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will do anything to keep your mind, your eyes, your ears off the message of the gospel. Hell is a real place. Men may laugh and they may make jokes about the existence of such a place as hell. Natural instinct is either to ignore it, to not think about it whatsoever, or to deny it. Men really don't want to hear about hell, and they want to make it the brunt of jokes. They want to make the devil to be a little horned figure with a pitchfork because they don't want to hear that their sin one day is going to be punished in such a way that I want to tell you defies description. It defies description. And so they make statements to the effect, once the jokes are over and past and beyond, it's something like, well, you know, God is such a God of love and mercy that he wouldn't punish somebody in hell forever. God is saying, in essence, I don't bend my law. I will not tolerate sin to go unpunished. I will not wink my eye. I will not pass over transgression. Sin must be punished. God is love. Blessed be his name for that truth. But God is holy. And this God loves holiness. This God loves purity. The only two emotions proper to God are love and wrath. Love and wrath. You young people who know not the Lord, you listen to me. There will be no tears from your mom and dad on that day. Plenty of tears in this life. They have pled with you, they have prayed for you to come, to come to Jesus Christ, to turn from your life of sin, to put your trust in Him. And you have laughed and spurned all their pleas. But on that day, on that day, when, they, when the Lord says, bind them hand and foot, your mom and dad who have been redeemed are going to say, Amen. God's will be done. Everything changes that. How you look at things completely changed that day. Turn and live. Repent and believe. Come to Christ. And if you go the rest of your days, however long that is, disobeying that gospel command to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to find out the reason for hell. There is a price to pay, and God says you're going to pay it. Now you tell me, preacher, you're just trying to scare me. You're dead right. You're dead right. You ought to be scared to death of hell. Your companions of hell will be sodomites and lesbians and murderers and churchgoers and Sunday school teachers and preachers, these shall go away. The company that makes up hell, the damned, the wicked, it's all over a place of unfailing memory. Your memory will be alive and well. If you are found that day, and I am there at the right hand of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to see you bound hand and foot. You're going to remember me. And down in the pit of hell, you're going to remember every time your minister said, Now is the time. Now is the day of salvation. You're going to remember. You're going to remember your mom and your dad pleading with you. And yes, perhaps arguing with you. Because they didn't want to see you go down to hell. You're going to remember all the opportunities you had.
that, that Trista Yonday is just going to mess my life up. And all my friends and my, what will they say about me? Who cares? Who cares what they'll say? Hell is real. Maybe this will be the last time you'll hear my voice. Maybe this will be the last time you'll hear some preacher say, Now's the time. One more time I ask you, will you come? I plead with you, will you come tonight? And the Lord plead with you. Don't wait. What would you do if God or if Jesus came back and you say, but God, I was going to come. I was going to come up. And it would be too late. <laughs> Think about that, y'all. Don't wait. Don't wait. Just come up. It's not worth it. This is the day. This is the hour. Satan, you can't have them any longer. Yes. They are God's property. Yes. And we command you to take your hands off of the property of God. Lord, we claim them and we plead the blood of Jesus right now. In Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, here I am again, and I'm so thankful that you clicked on this video to watch it. I want to start by saying that I by no means know everything. I by no means think that I'm better than anyone else. I believe that nothing can strain you out of heaven quicker than pride. In all honesty, you know, I couldn't impress any scholars with my nice, delicate speech. I couldn't argue theology with the smartest of smarts and with people at seminary. But I do know something, and I, and I want you to know it. And that's the reason I even make these videos to begin with, is because I know something that is true and it's something that I've got to get to you. And hey, if you feel like I'm preaching uh, at you or to you in this video, I am. Many people have a hunger to hear teachers and preachers preach things that are extremely generic. But I found when you drive something very specific home, people in the end end up getting offended. And a lot of times, if they don't get offended, they'll look to the people around them to see whose life does this fit in the best. Well, I think that person needs to do it, and that person for sure needs to do it. I know this specific person really needs to hear this, and they forget to see if they need to hear this. They don't even realize that they may need it infinitely more. So what I want you to ask yourself during this video is, does this message that he's bringing condemn me, or does it assure me of my pardon? And I encourage you to not become so busy with criticizing the messenger, or the way he talks, or the way he looks, or the way he always sounds so heavy all the time or the way that he sometimes sounds mean. Don't be so busy criticizing those things that your own soul perishes. Every word I'm about to tell you is from a place of love. You know, I could make a video today telling you about how loving and how merciful God is, which he is. Uh, I would fall infinitely short of even describing how merciful and loving he truly is, but that would also be the most popular of my videos yet. But the thing we have to remember as Christians is that God is just. God is severely and inflexibly just. You know, if I wasn't in fellowship with Jesus, and if I wanted your soul to be damned, and I didn't really care about you at all, and if I hated you, and if I wanted to make you feel all tingly inside, if I wanted to appeal to your flesh, I'd throw you some flowery garbage that would make you feel better about your best life now. But since your walk with Jesus has nothing to do with your flesh, I'm going to tell you something of far more important. I find if I mention the wrath of God, people tend to just laugh it off like it's just this joke or something. Even if I say the word hell, people chuckle like it's some fantasy that I've made up just to sound a certain way. They laugh it off like I think that I'm playing a game. Believers in the Bible that laugh hell off like it's no big deal and laugh sin off like it's no big deal obviously don't believe the Bible. They also advertise on the highest public beacon their complete absence of the fear of the Lord in their lives. You hear foolish things like, well, there's no love in your message. Let me tell you a story. There's these three people on the sidewalk. One is just standing there. Another is an amputee who has no legs that's sitting on the curb. And another man is walking down the sidewalk. So the man walking down the sidewalk sees the amputee and he sees that he's on fire. And he knows that any second that amputee could be dead. He grabs his coat. He takes his coat off, goes and wraps it around him, throws it down, puts a bucket of water on him, tackles him. The man ends up flat on his back. But the fire's out, and he saved his life. But all of a sudden, an observer that's just sitting on the wall says to the guy that saved that amputee's life, man, there's no love in that message. What are you thinking? You're going to turn that guy off. And what an absurd claim that would be. Either that person would have to be out of their right mind, or they didn't truly believe that the amputee was on fire. You think everlasting punishment is a fate that sinners never need to hear. Don't tell them that. You'll turn them off. I suppose that if a blind man was walking towards a 1,000-foot cliff and didn't know it, that for the sake of love, he wouldn't need to hear that he was was walking towards that cliff either. God is a just judge, and God is angry with the wicked every day. If he does not turn back, he will sharpen his sword 
He bends his bow and makes it ready. He also prepares for himself instruments of death. He makes his arrows into fiery shafts. This is God's heart toward the wicked man. But God is a God of love and he still stands ready to forgive. So what is the response? Well, to put it into the words of the captain of our salvation, repent and believe the gospel. So what does it mean to repent? Some of you, possibly many, have repented already. You remember a time when you said a little prayer and since then you feel great. You're happy to know that you've been reconciled to God and that now you can live however you want. Now all these sins that you're committing don't really matter anymore because I did that when I was younger and so I know that I'm saved. That's the type of repentance that doesn't move you even wanting closer to escaping the jaws of hell. And so some of you now have repented for the fear of hell. You're afraid of being damned forever. But you have never really felt like anything you've ever done was that bad. You never really felt like you did anything too heinous or too bad. You never did any crimes. You had a nice family growing up. There were no domestic disputes. You thought everything was good. You were a pretty good kid in your eyes. But despite all that, you repented because you still wanted to avoid hell. This type of repentance doesn't land you into heaven, though you can come to God in this way. You can't stay there. That's not the type of repentance that sustains you. But true repentance is the hatred of the deed done and not of the punishment that follows the deed. Every murderer repents of the noose that is about his neck, but when you set him free, he'll commit the same crime that landed him there. Every thief repents of stealing, but tomorrow he'll do the same thing if you set him free out of prison. Repentance is not a hatred of the punishment. It's a hatred of the deed itself. Sin is the deed that lands you hell. You've got to hate sin, not just hell. True repentance would happen even if there was no hell. Even if you thought there was no punishment for the sin you've committed, you'd still hate your sin. If you don't have this type of repentance, you will be lost. You may be the type of person that actually thinks they're doing God a favor by believing in His Son. But I tell you solemnly that your damnation is closer than it's ever been. Some of you watching this video will go to hell if you died tonight. Some of you are going to die years from now and you'll still go to hell. But your blood will be on your own head. And you won't be able to look to me and say, Why didn't you say anything to me about this wrath that I'm under? The blame will be on you for damning yourself. You will be your own murderer. This video is here. No matter how ineloquent it is, no matter how much you disagree with it, it is a proper warning for you. If I didn't love you, I would just sit around my whole life and just do things for me and never do anything out of love for you. And I would never say a word to you and I would never make one Facebook video and I would die and go to hell and your blood would be on my hands. And your blood would be on my hands. But life is too short to ignore warnings. And the day is coming when you will stand before God. A day is coming when you can't dodge the question. When all of your fingers will point back at you and when everything you've ever done will be sorted out right before the eyes of the Almighty. Everything you've done that you are ashamed of, everything that you've hidden in the deepest and darkest parts of your heart will be seen more clearly and more brightly than ever on that day. Every idle word that you said will go before the judgment of God. You want to know why I really make these? I make these because I understand that I am going to stand before Jesus and He's going to judge me. And as much as I've scorned the word judge in my life, don't you judge me, that's judgmentalism. Don't do this, you don't know me. He's going to judge me. And he's going to judge me for every idle word. He's going to judge me for everything I did. And he would have judged me for not making use of what I had to try to reach people. Because some of you aren't ready. But my heart mainly goes out to the people that think they're sneaking after God already. Because... Jesus said to strive to enter in through the narrow gate, but you're, you're fine with living carnal. And so my heart mostly breaks for people like me that did serve God, that were serving God, that, that did think they repented. People like me that are the church, they're Jesus Christ's body, they are his disciples, yet there's no concern for the lost. And it's okay to live carnally all day long and to think carnal thoughts and let your flesh do whatever it wants to do. But they refuse to stop tolerating sin in their life and they refuse to repent. And they live in a constant state of carnality and live in rebellion against God. And it's the carnal Christians that love the same things that the world loves, that's best friends with the world, that loves to laugh at the same things, that has a good time doing the same things. All of their affections are set on the same things. They're dark in the same ways, but they're church people. They tolerate the same things in their life. There's no heavy hand about sin. There's no burden for the lost. And Christians like that are the reason that God's name is blasphemed among lost people because they think, I can serve a Jesus like that. He's cool with me living how I want to live. Because look, they just laughed at the same thing I laughed at. 
They just made a joke. They laughed at the worst joke that I know, the most vile joke I know. And look, they're here with me and they look exactly like me, but they're on their way to heaven. That's the reason God's name is blasphemed. But we have the ability to stand with boldness on that day, on that day of judgment. Those things that we are so ashamed of in the deepest, blackest parts of our heart will be wiped away forever. We can never do it just by living good our whole lives. You never get there by just trying to do good deeds. But the blood of Jesus. But the blood of Jesus, if we repent and if we confess our sins, it will wash us whiter than snow. He's so merciful towards us and He will forgive us if we repent of our sins. If you refuse to repent, you refuse heaven. God's wrath, which is even now hovering over your head, will take you over. And it could even happen today. But if you repent, and if you continue repenting for Christ's sake all of your life, God will forgive you of all of your sin and you'll be washed white as snow. He will pour out His favor on you. He will keep you in perfect peace because your mind is stayed on Him and because you trust in Him. He will lavish His steadfast love all over you. And even now, He loves you. But if the wicked don't turn back, He will sharpen His sword. Please don't wait even ten minutes more to make sure that you're right with God. And if you think that you're right with God, to make sure that you're right with God. Because really, it could cost you your eternity. You ever thought that there are people that have gone to hell today that never thought they would go there? I mean, they might have thought they would go there, but they never really believed that they would go to hell. They never actually knew what hell was going to be like. They never actually believed that they would someday go there. They probably thought they were good, you know. I mean, after all, they're Christians. Of course they never thought they were going to go there, but they're there right now. Many of them cursing God because some preacher told them that God was love and that love was tolerance and that God would never make them feel condemned. Ever heard the phrase, a little sugar makes the medicine go down? More like a little truth makes deception acceptable. I want to be very clear on something. I have a heart for every soul, lost and saved. But this video, from the very first idea of it until the very last edit that I made, was made for church people. I've spoken out in the past, and I think it's funny because a lot of church people have come up to me and they say, you're going to turn all the lost people off, or you're going to make sinners want to have nothing to do with you. They miss the whole point. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to church people. The people that already think they believe in Christ. The people that serve in churches. The people that evangelize the lost. The people of the church. You know, I'm going to tell you something. It is an absolute, no second question, no explanation, no hearing of your life story, impossibility for you to be saved and yet live in a continuous state of worldliness. And you say things like, God will forgive me. God has been with me since I was a kid. After all, I got saved a long time ago. Surely he will just forget about all this. And you say things like that, but you keep on doing all of the evil you can. You intentionally indulge in your favorite sin. And while there's still time to stop... While there's still time for you to just think about it and say, no, I don't want to do it. In the same breath you say, boy, I'm sure glad God is merciful. But Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father, looks down from heaven and he says, do you have any idea what your forgiveness cost me? I had flesh torn off my neck and back and legs. I had a crown of thorns jammed into my head. I was stabbed in the side. Gore gushed from my hands and from my feet and from my back just to cover the thing that you were so lightly indulging in. But in truth, these things that I went through in the physical, they were nothing compared to what I was going through in the spiritual. If you multiplied all of these physical things that I had gone through times a thousand, it still could not cover your one sin. Don't you know? That God the Father beat me to pieces. He obliterated me beyond recognition. He took the cup of wrath that had your name on it and he splashed it onto my perfectly sinless and bleeding face. And what's worse is that God did this to me with a smile. It pleased him to crush me for you. That's what your forgiveness costs me. Most professing Christians have never realized their actual need for Christ. They've been invited to come to Him in such a way that it seems like, well, I'm doing God a favor just to believe in Christ. They've never been told that the very first level of Christianity is a complete denial of all of your desires and of everything that you've ever been. They've not been clearly shown that whosoever does not wake up in the morning and die to every one of his desires is not even worthy of walking in Jesus' footsteps. They don't understand that being a Christian means that they are crucified to the world and that the world is crucified to them. That means that the world thinks of you as a fool that has nothing to contribute to society and that there is nothing that the world offers that you could desire. That you now have nothing to do with sin 
and everything to do with God. It hasn't been told to very many professing Christians that Jesus said and meant no one can serve two masters. You will hate one and you will love the other every time. If you do not mind it very much when people use his glorious name in vain, if you do not mind being seen in places that were built to be places of sin, if you do not feel deeply offended at the fornications in your favorite movies, at the scoffing of the glorious name of Jesus, and at jokes that defy his very throne and slap his face in rebellion, then you hate him. And it's really not hard to figure out because Jesus said, you will hate one and love the other always. If you love the world, you hate him, or else Jesus was wrong. But you say, no, that ain't true. I love Jesus. Jesus is Lord. But who are you trying to convince? Isn't it interesting when anyone brings a word of correction about your sin, you immediately pass them off as unchristlike and judgmental. It's disgusting that it's more of a scandal in this church culture to reprove sin than it is to laugh at it. The one who says sin is wrong is judgmental, and the one who commits it and encourages others to do it is Christ-like. How disgusting. You don't want to be like God. You just want people to back off when they start reproving the thing that you were the most in love with. True love for God means true hatred of sin. In Matthew 7 and in Luke 13, Jesus says that many will be telling him on that day that he is the actual Lord of their life, but he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. Your professed faith in Jesus means absolutely nothing. You say, well, you know, Nate, you really can't just judge a book by its cover. Well, I heard a great preacher recently say that that whole idea is really an invent of Satan because Jesus said you can judge a book by its cover because in John 15 he said you will know false prophets by their fruit. Tell me, how long would it actually take you if you walked up to an apple tree and they were fruits of apples all over it for you to say that it was an apple tree. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered and they gather them and throw them into the fire. No one has to hear what you've been through. No one has to know that at one point you got saved. All they have to do is look at your fruit. You've been serving in church your whole life. But look at your fruit for a second. What are the things that come out of your mouth when you talk to people in conversation? What are your affections set toward? Are they God things? You can tell him that you've served in church. You can tell him that he's Lord. But if you die without bearing Christ's fruits, you will go to hell for all of eternity. And ten million years will pass. And you'll be under the weight of this thing that no human on earth can bear for even a second. And it'll be like no time has passed in eternity. No time. hundred million years passes and... It's the same. You're there. There you are suffering the wrath of God because you believe some lying creature that was a wolf in sheep's clothing that just tried to encourage you. And so you may be saying, as many already have, hey, you're judgmental, you're unchristlike, you're condescending, you're heavy, you're turning people off by the way that you talk. Can't you see that I want you to live? That is the main purpose of your existence, to live. That is God's number one desire. The biggest problem in the Bible, if you would read it, that God is faced with is that if He is just, He cannot forgive you. Go talk to the lost people on the streets and see if they don't tell you that God is forgiving. They've heard of the tremendous love of God and yet they're still in love with the very sin that crushed and murdered Him. And so are many of you. Hey, let's watch a movie tonight. What, there's nudity and there's 12 GDs? 140 F words? That's alright. I have freedom in Christ. Freedom from what? Freedom to let some of the worst words that can spill out of a human mouth serve as your entertainment? And yet you still claim that you love Him with your whole heart? You make lighthearted gestures at the very things that murdered Him? And not only that, but you spit in the bloody face of the Lamb of God as He hangs on the jagged wood, taking your wrath. And you say, don't worry. He forgives. Do you know the character of the God you serve? In the book of Jeremiah, God's people have been wicked by serving other gods and having their affections set on other things and willfully sinning and not saying that they had sinned and not acknowledging their need for God. So we find Jeremiah in chapter 14 repenting, genuine biblical repentance for the people of God. And he said, Lord, we confess our wickedness and that of our ancestors too. We have all sinned against you. For the sake of your reputation, Lord, do not abandon us. Do not disgrace your own glorious throne. Please remember us and do not break your covenant with us. It's really good repentance. It's really genuine. It's better than what most of you have prayed. But what may shock you is God's response. Even if Moses and Samuel stood before me pleading for these people, I wouldn't help them. Away with them. Get them out of my sight. Then he told Jeremiah, do not go to funerals to mourn and show sympathy for these people, for I have removed my peace and my protection from them. I have taken away my unfailing love and mercy. These weren't the lost people of the world, these were his people. So you may be questioning, Nate, why are you saying this? To me, you still sound judgmental. Well, I heard a story of a young man that was dying on his deathbed and his brother was there next to him. And he said, brother, 
Why have you been so indifferent to me about my soul as you have been? And his brother said, indifferent? I haven't been indifferent to you. I, I've spoken to you often about it. And the brother said, yeah, you've spoken. But I think that if you would have remembered that I was going down to hell, you would have been more earnest with me. Every time you hear a sermon and you see a video or you hear a song that's convicting or anything, you have a chance to either repent or to harden your heart. Some of you have watched a video that I've made in the past and you've thought, man, that's really good. Or, or maybe you've told me, hey, I'm going to start changing. Thank you for this and this. But you really haven't decided to go ahead and change and tap into the grace of God. You're hardening your heart against Him. You're making it harder for yourself. Don't make your judgment twice as bad for hearing the word of the Lord and then ignoring it. I'm telling you about hell and I'm telling you that some of you are going to go there unless you repent. But if you harden your heart and you live your whole life and you die and go to hell without repenting, you will look back on the day that you watch this video and from the flames of hell you will curse you will curse the day you were born you will curse this day and you will say I wish I had never even watched that because now I know that he was right now I know that this hell is real that he wasn't just trying to scare me and that I was going I was going to burn there for all of eternity now I see the truth now I see I've got to tell you something very solemn there's nothing in this life that you can do that will take away glory from God. And in the end, He will be glorified in your life. There's a verse of Scripture that talks about how for all of eternity, the lake of fire will be open for people to come and see the fierce wrath of God. And they will be able to observe how majestic He is and they will see it with awe in their hearts and they will come back and worship Him. The Lion of God who stomps His enemies until their blood sprinkles all of His robes, they will come bow before Him and say, Holy Holy, holy is the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. But you know what mercy is? Mercy is that you can choose. And so you choose. Will God be glorified by your damnation and eternal punishment? Or will He be glorified by your salvation and your worship? I realize that a lot of you think I'm crazy. I was told that. But just ask yourself, what is going to matter when you are on your deathbed if you get one? And when you're just a few breaths away from death, what is going to matter is it going to matter whether or not you've graduated from college? No. Is it going to matter whether or not I've written a song or whether or not I've uh, painted a picture or done anything? Nothing's going to matter when your breath's away from eternity. Don't you think that you'll wish when that time comes that you had really loved God the way you said you did? That you'd actually flip the TV off a little more to study His God-breathed scriptures? I know I will. No matter how much I've done it, I'll know that I wish I would have done it more. But the good news is... Christ is calling. He's calling loud. Wisdom is calling out in the streets. He's calling for you to come. He is holding the door of mercy as wide open as it can go. And He is saying, come and dine with me. To dine with Him, you have to die to you. The one whose name you abuse and whose cross you mock by the way that you live is alive and He's coming. But you may die before He does. All you have is now. Let me share with you something that I see in the youth group, but I also see in the church at large, individual congregations. Because we have dumbed down the gospel, because we're not preaching the true gospel, and we are using carnal means to attract people. If you use carnal means to attract men, you're going to attract carnal men. And you're going to have to keep using greater carnal means to keep them in the church. So what has happened is this. We have these large churches filled with many unconverted carnal people. But in those churches, we also have this small group of people that honestly want Christ. And they honestly want His Word. And they honestly want to be transformed. They don't need anything else. All they need is true worship of the true God and Scripture being preached to them and lived out before them. That's what they want. Now I want to tell you the great sin of the American pastor. And this has got me in a lot of trouble, but it's true. This small group of converted people in that local church 
all they want is Jesus. And all they want to do is the right thing. They want purity. They want truth. They want Christ. But the pastor, in order to keep this larger group of unconverted people, he caters to them. So while he is feeding these carnal men and women with carnal things, he is letting the sheep of God starve to death and he is going to stand before God one day in judgment. Listen, brother, if, if my wife was going grocery shopping and when she was going out to her car, some men assailed her, attacked her brutally, and you walked by and you did not want to get involved because you didn't want to cause trouble. You didn't want to put yourself in harm's way. You just wanted everything to go, go smooth. After all that was done, I would look for those men to deal with them. But I want you to know this. I'd look for you too. Because you had a chance to stand for my wife, my bride. And out of self-preservation or wrong ideas, you did not do it. You're just as much responsible as those men who attacked her. And that's what's happening all throughout America with pastors. It's the bride of Christ. There are sheep in all these churches, many of them, even churches that seem somewhat heretical in places. You usually find a group of people who truly want Christ, but the leadership is catering to the carnal and letting the bride of Christ starve to death, impoverished. And that is wrong. And there's going to be judgment for it. And the same thing is happening to the youth. I know young people that say, you know, Brother Paul, I listen to you all the time. And I said, well, what about your church? He goes, well, they don't preach this. It's not what the other young people want. And so they give them what they want. I'm starving to death. A little child of God, it would be better than a millstone be tied around your neck than you cause this little one to stumble. The making of a son of perdition was an apostle. The making of an apostate is a professing Christian. It's an alarming thing, is it not? You say, well, how does he do it, Brother Curran? I'll give you this shortly. First of all, there will come a day in your life, even though you're a sincere professor in Jesus Christ, There'll come a day in your life if you neglect the ways of God. If you spurn the means of grace that Brother Paul addressed in the previous hour of secret prayer and the reading and appropriation of God's Word, there will come a day where increasingly you become conformed to this world and you'll no longer be convicted about your sin. No longer will God cease to annoy you about your sin. You see the reality of that. Ephesians chapter 4, it speaks of those who are past feeling. Secondly, you're no longer restrained in your sin. You'll look at things, you'll speak of things in a despicable way before God. Those things, they don't bother you. When you sin against God, you're not convicted. You sin more and more without any restraining influence of the Holy Spirit. Much like Saul. The Scripture says in 1 Samuel chapter 13 and verse 12, when Samuel comes and says, What have you done in offering this offering before the Lord? Saul said, I saw that you came not within the days appointed, therefore I forced myself to offer this offering. Friend, from that day forward, you never find where Saul forced himself to disobey God again. Then thirdly, listen to this. The third step in the process is God will let you sin and let you think you're getting away with it. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 11, Because sentence against the evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. And then finally, the final stage, listen, is God will lead you into more temptation. What? Matthew chapter 6 and verse 13, the model prayer, Jesus says, Father, lead us not into temptation. 
The phrase presupposes that it's possible for God to lead into temptation. You say, how is that? I didn't say God causes you to sin. I didn't say that God tempts you. But God does not tempt according to James chapter 1. But I'm telling you, friend, He will so back off of your life. It's like the temptation of sin is given to you consistently on a silver platter. It's for the purpose of hardening your heart more and more. It's the wrath of abandonment. I have been in conferences like this for a number of years. And people come with such hunger, seemingly such an insatiable appetite for truth and to obey God. But can I tell you that sadly, in a venue such as this, potentially you may be sitting beside one of the greatest apostates that the world has ever known. What will you do with what you've heard? And friends, this is the day of your salvation. Jesus publicly declared himself to be the only God. And some of you don't know Jesus as God. You have to take him at his word. You can't make him into someone he is not or less than he truly is. And so you've got a decision to make. Is Jesus your God? Not just your teacher, not your leader, not your example, not your inspiration, but your God and your Savior. Some of you, today, God is working in your heart and he is stirring in your soul. Some of it may have been a process leading up to today that culminates with you saying, that's it, Jesus is my God, I become a Christian today by the grace of God. For some of you, it's something that God is beginning to work in you right now. And this is not just information, it is for you unsettling. Yes, I have not really considered Jesus as I ought to. Who is he and who is he to me? Let me say that that is God stirring and working and beginning to birth new life, Christian life in you. For some of you, you've borrowed the faith of your parents or your friends or your family and you need to have your own relationship with Jesus. And you can't just say, Jesus is our God. You have to say, Jesus is my God, we love you. We're so glad you're here. And we want you to know Jesus as God. Brother Mike, back on the radio. Arizona, welcome to HardcoreChristianity.com. Jezebel, the church monster. Jezebel spirit. I'm going to explain it today from a biblical perspective and from a psychological perspective. If you've got a Jezebel in your church or in your living, you're living with one in your family, well, are you in some deep trouble? This powerful demon is a monster. Have you ever known anybody that had a Jezebel spirit? This powerful spirit is extremely dangerous. If this evil spirit enters your church, you're going to be in extremely dire straits shortly. The spirit is a male, and it looks for, most of the time, female humans. And this spirit, this Jezebel spirit, usually always looks for an intelligent woman. And they look for women who had poor father figures and women who have been traumatized in childhood. The reason they're looking for women who've been traumatized in childhood is because they have to be let in to the person by another spirit, and it is the spirit of rejection. The rejection spirit is the most prevalent demon I see in my counseling practice, and it comes from um, abuse in childhood. Abuse, childhood pain, major disappointments, abandonment, divorce, things like that. Trauma in a child opens the door to the rejection demon. This Jezebel spirit is a man hater and a man controller. This spirit wants to be in control. And they're generally speaking, psychologically attracted to men in authority. They're not looking for the janitor or the custodian at the church. They're looking for the male at the church who, is, who has authority and who is in control. 
partial control or complete control, the pastor, the associate pastor, board members, things like that. They like men in authority, and they have a tremendous ability to uh, appear holy and repentant and humble in public, but behind the scenes, they are the opposite. They live unholy lives. They will not repent because they've got this rebellion sensation through their, in their spirit, and they are not humble. They're controllers, manipulators. And how they manipulate is very interesting. They use their, usually use their sensuality to control men. They also use public humiliation and sex. They love to control men through threatened public humiliation and through their sensuality and their sexuality. But in their private lives, publicly they appear holy. Privately, they are not. The Jezebel spirit is basically a witchcraft demon. They're very religious, they're very spiritual, and they're very much in rebellion. They want to control others, they want to be in authority, and they use deceit and chronic manipulation to do that. And in the book of Revelation, something very interesting was illustrated to us. Jesus ran into this powerful demon a woman named Jezebel in the New Testament church. It's in Revelation chapter 2. Do you remember that? Jesus said, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants, teaching them and seducing them. Now, you see, it's a female who's in authority, who likes control, and who is a seducer, a manipulator. That's the Greek word planeo, and it means, it's a Greek verb, it means to deceive someone. And it says, Jesus says, she, she teaches and seduces them to commit fornication. That's the Greek word pornuo, it was a Greek verb, and it means to engage in some type of sexual immorality, and in this particular context, it was related to religion and idolatry. And Jesus said, this woman who is teaching, who's in control, who's seducing people, and or, teaching them to commit fornication and teaching them to commit religious idolatry. Jesus said, I gave her space to repent. He gave her a chance to repent. What a great illustration of the Son of God. Even this type of a person infected with this type of a superpower demon, he still prefers mercy and still prefers grace to help in time of need. What an incredible Savior and what an amazing Lord you are serving today. If you get involved with someone who has a Jezebel spirit, uh, you are going to, at some point in time, have thoughts of, my God, I've got to get out of here. And some people will actually pack up and run from women who have these powerful demons. These Jezebel demons always have relationship problems. They always have deep-seated self, uh, self-centered self insecurity, poor self-concepts. And these spirits are extremely difficult to get out, uh, will not change and will not repent and will not place themselves emotionally in a position to get healed. They have to be crushed. And so when you turn somebody over to the Lord who has a Jezebel spirit, they won't repent and cannot be delivered from this powerful demon until they are broken. So what usually happens is some kind of terrible negativity comes into the person's life an accident, an illness, a death in the family, something that really shakes them to the core, and then they will repent. If you have a Jezebel spirit and you want to be delivered and you're ready to repent and you've been broken, 602-636-5800. God wants to heal you and deliver you and give you the full power of the Holy Spirit and a true, broken, loving, humble heart. Hi, my name is Richard Hartline, and I would like to speak heart to heart today uh, concerning the subject of false teachers and false teaching and false prophets in the Bible and how they relate to us today and what we see around this. My purpose today is to try to biblically show why we are admonished um, to do this, to to. Be, have our eyes open to expose false teachers and false prophets. Uh, um, the purpose of this uh, recording today is not to talk about specific people or specific false teachers, but to lay down the biblical precedent that we as believers have to do this. First of all, the Bible says we are to try them. Beloved, 
believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they be of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. 1 John 4, 1. The church in Ephesus was commended because they had tried them which said they were apostles and are not, and you have found them as liars. That's in Revelation chapter 2, 2. And then the church of Pergamos was rebuked because they tolerated those that held the doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. That's Re Revelation chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. It's never right to tolerate false teachers, but they are to be tried by the word of God and exposed. But the problem is this, that those who want to disobey the word of God will seek by every means to avoid this teaching. That's the problem. The Bible also says we're to mark and to avoid them. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which we have learned, doctrine which we have learned, and avoid them, Romans 16, 17. And I just want to reiterate that uh, the purpose of this uh, recording is not to specifically name any false doctrine or false teachers um, in this particular recording, but it is to give the biblical precedent that it's not only okay, but it's commanded for us to do. It's not unloving or unkind to point out false teachers, false doctrine. Now, you know, the Bible refers to these people as wolves in sheep's clothing. So by not warning the sheep, we're actually opening the door to the sheep pen and allowing the wolves to come in and devour the sheep. We're, what we're saying is, come on in, wolfy, wolfy. I got some lamb chops for you to eat. The Bible also says we are to rebuke them face to face or any way we can. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Titus 1, 13. Now, this was written to Titus because there were those who were going from house to house subverting whole households with false doctrine. This is very similar to what is going on today uh, in the church as far as Christian uh, broadcasting and, and Christian TV and much of the silly doctrine that's coming across the airwaves into these households. You know, a good meaning for discernment is this. Discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It is knowing the difference between right and almost right. In the Gospels, there are 14 scripture references to, uh, in reference to false teachers, false doctrine, and false prophets. 18 in the epistles. So do you think it's just a little important? Do you think that somebody should be at least paying attention to these things? You know, if something's in the Bible once, it's important. If it's in there twice, it's very, very important. And if it's in there three times, it's over the top. But 14 times in the Gospels and 18 times in the Epistles, I think it's important. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Also, Jesus said, not everyone who says to be Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I said, and then I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. So we could be building great churches. We could be missionaries. We can be... Uh, Christian broadcasters have great TV shows, record albums, um, uh, famous artists, and none of that matters. What, does, what matters to Jesus? He who does the will of my Father in heaven. That's what's important to Jesus. And that's what's in the scripture. And that's what the church in America is missing. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be also false teachers among you, who will secretly, secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. One more scripture here from Ephesians 5, 11 through 13. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, now, the thing about reproving people and bringing to light 
Uh, this is all, often labeled as unloving, unkind, uh, who are you to judge, you're dividing the body of Christ, and uh, this has nothing to do with what Scripture says, because the Scripture says any unfruitful work of darkness were to expose them, not cover them up, and just sweep them under the carpet. This is Paul talking in Acts. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. This is a charge to shepherds. Listen to this real closely. To feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, even among your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn you every one night and day with tears. So I think it's clear, I think it's so evident that we are to expose false teachers and false doctrine. Now, here's the biggie. Are we permitted? Are we commanded or are we forbidden to name false teachers and false prophets by name? You know, many mistakenly believe that it's wrong to expose error and then to name the guilty teachers, but they are wrong according to the Bible. Uh, I want to give scripture for all this, and, uh, and I don't like to usually use antidotes, but uh, I would like to use this one. If there was a child molester living across the street, and your child was going to that person's house, I'm going to tell you, name and address, and to avoid him. I'm not going to look at you and say, hey, beware of child molesters. Uh, I'm not going to name the name because I don't want to hurt them. So to not name a false teacher who is deceiving somebody, they're being deceived, would be ridiculous. All right. But let's see what the Bible has to say about it. Paul himself named Peter publicly. Peter was guilty of an unscriptural practice. He was mixing the law with grace. And here it is. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him, Paul said, face to face, because he was to be blamed. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter, before them all, in front of them all, if thou, being a Jew, lives after the manner of the Gentiles, and not to the Jews, then why do you compel the Gentiles to live as the Jews? Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 through 14. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, Paul named Demas for loving the world. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Paul also named Hymenaeus and Alexander. Paul told Timothy to war a good warfare, holding faith and good conscience, which some have put away concerning the faith, and have made shipwreck, of who is Hymenaeus and Alexander, there they are, the names, who I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. This is in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. Paul also named Hymenaeus and Philetus. He told Timothy to study that he might be able to rightly divide the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as does the canker of who Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is already past, and overthrow the faith of some. This is in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 through 18. Paul also named Alexander the coppersmith. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works, of whom be thou aware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. This is 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 14 through 15. John also named Diotrephes. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, received us not. So in conclusion, I think it's safe to say that the Bible not only teaches, but commands us to expose false teachers, false prophets, and false doctrine, and name those false teachers and those false prophets by name when necessary. This is Richard Hartline, loving you enough to tell you the truth.
at the whole religious scene today and all I see are the inventions and ministries of man and flesh. It's mostly powerless. It has no impact on the world. And I see more of the world coming into the church and impacting the church rather than the church impacting the world. I see the music taking over the house of God. I see entertainment taking over the house of God. An obsession with entertainment in God's house, a hatred of correction and a hatred of reproof. Nobody wants to hear it anymore. Whatever happened to anguish in the house of God? Whatever happened to anguish in the ministry? It's a word you don't hear in this pampered age. You don't hear it. Anguish means extreme pain and distress. The emotion so stirred that it becomes painful. Acute, deeply felt inner pain because of conditions about you, in you or around you. Anguish, deep pain, deep sorrow, agony of God's heart. We've held on to our religious rhetoric in our revival talk, but we've become so passive. All true passion is born out of anguish. All true passion for Christ comes out of a baptism of anguish. You search the scripture and you'll find that when God determined to recover a ruined situation, he would share his own anguish for what God saw happening to his church and to his people and he would find a praying man and he would take that man and literally baptize him in anguish. You find it in the book of Nehemiah. Jerusalem is in ruins. How is God going to deal with this? How is God going to restore the ruin? Now folks, look at me. Nehemiah was not a preacher. He was a career man. But this was a praying man. And God found a man who would not just have a flash of emotion, not just some great sudden burst of concern and then let it die. He said, no, I broke down and I wept and I mourned and I fasted. And then I began to pray night and day. Why didn't these other men, why didn't they have an answer? Why didn't God use them in restoration? Why didn't they have a word? Because there was no sign of anguish. No weeping. Not a word of prayer. It's all ruined. Does it matter to you today? Does it matter to you at all that God's spiritual Jerusalem, the church, is now married to the world? That there's such a coldness sweeping the land? Closer than that, does it matter about the Jerusalem that's in our own hearts? The sign of ruin that's slowly draining spiritual power and passion, blind to lukewarmness, blind to the mixture that's creeping in. That's all the devil wants to do is get the fight out of you and kill it. So you won't labor in prayer anymore. You won't weep before God anymore. You can sit and watch television and your family go to hell. Uh, let me ask you, is, is what I just said convicted you at all? There's a great difference between anguish and concern. Concern is something that, you, that begins to interest you. You take an interest in a project or a cause or a concern or a need. I'm going to tell you something I've learned over all my years, 50 years of preaching. If it is not born in anguish, if it has not been born by the Holy Spirit, where when you saw and heard of the ruin that drove you to your knees, and all our projects, all our ministries, everything we do, where are the Sunday school teachers that weep over kids they know are not hearing and they're going to hell? You see, a true prayer life begins at the place of anguish, a place where lifetime decisions are made. You see, if you, you set your heart to pray, God's going to come and start sharing his heart with you. You see, you, you, you either 
walk away and go back to your passivity and say, I'm just going to be an ordinary Christian and there's no such thing. Or your heart begins to cry out, oh God, your name is being blasphemed. The Holy Spirit's being mocked. The enemy is out trying to destroy the testimony of the Lord's faithfulness and something has to be done. He can't go unchallenged. There's going to be no renewal, no revival, no awakening until we're willing to let him once again break us. Folks, it's getting late and it's getting serious. Please don't tell me. Don't tell me you're concerned. Don't tell me that you want your unsaved loved ones saved when you're spending hours in front of internet or television. Come on. Lord, there's some need to get this altar and confess. I am not what I was. I am not where I'm supposed to be. God, I don't have your heart or your burden. I've been, I wanted it easy. Just want to be happy. But Lord, true joy comes. True joy comes out of anguish. There's nothing of the flesh will give you joy. I don't care how much money, I don't care what kind of new house there is absolutely nothing physical could give you joy it's only what is accomplished by the Holy Spirit when you obey him and take on his heart and build the walls around your family build the walls around your own heart and make you strong and impregnable against the enemy